So one day my daughter comes home from school and says, um, she's a little upset and she says, Mom, I, um, when I told my friends I was Jewish, um, they said, they acted, reacted with surprise and they said, what, but I thought you were Spanish. So um, I could understand why she would be upset. Um, I had spent, because I studied the Spanish Middle Ages, especially the 15th century, I had seen that question asked over and over again from, um, from the 15th century and from also earlier centuries. Um, the Spanish state decided uh, early on um, for us, but later in the 15th century, that the answer was really no. You cannot be Jewish and Spanish. And this is the Edict of Expulsion, 1492, uh, ordering the Jews to leave Spain. Um, however, things were really not as, um, as clear cut. How did we get there? Um, the beginning of the end really uh, uh, came about, had come about a century earlier, in 1391, when the, really the pogroms, uh, the masculines of Jewish communities had started in um, Spanish cities. They continued through the 15th century and they, had, they spread like wildfire uh, sometimes. Um, one of the outcomes of these uh, pogroms, of these mass killings, was uh, mass conversions. Um, the mass conversions uh, were intended to solve the problem, to eradicate uh, the Jews from, from Spain, but it actually had the opposite effect. It pushed Jews further, deeper into Spanish, the Spanish society because uh, what happened is that it, it, uh, by making Jews uh, trying to assimilate, they made sure that Jewishness stayed in Spain. Um, the group of the conversos were seen, were, 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 a, were a weird group. They were uh, unprecedented as a social group and they were seen as anomalies. This is probably best seen in um, a book, a little treatise called the Alboraike. The Alboraike was, was a pamphlet written in the second, uh, second half of the 15th century, was copied and recopied and also uh, saw some printed versions the, through the 16th century. The Alboraike, um, presented um, the conversos as a monstrous hybrid. The, monstrous were, uh, the conversos were, were a hybrid, and being a hybrid was a bad thing. Um, the um, alboraike was a chimerical animal. It's taken from Islamic sources, and in the Islamic so sources, the alburak is the um, beautiful steed that takes Muhammad to the seventh heaven, uh, in the Islamic sources, it's white, it's beautiful, it's a winged animal, half donkey, half mule. However, in the 15th century, this animal is taken as the embodiment of hy hybridity and is mapped to the, all the characteristics that were wrong or that were monstrous about the conversos. Um, there are several, the, the uh, alboraike, as you can see here, is an animal composed of many parts of different animals. It also has a human foot and human eyes. It has the body of an ox. It has a tail um, like a snake. And it has um, the different um, the feet from different animals. Um, the conversos were not only seen or stereotyped by their, um, by their um, tainted nature, both uh, ethically or morally, or in, in um, physically, they were also stereotyped by um, what they ate, for example. And the Adafinas, which is the uh, Sephardic counterpart of the Cholent, of the Hamim, the um, stew pot that you put in the hearth um, Friday before sundown so that you can have something warm to eat on the day of rest on Saturday. And that's a plated version of the Hamim. A lot of Spanish people will recognize this as the cocido and olla and other such dishes. How was Jewishness portrayed before we got to the Alboraike? Well, let's look at a 13th century manuscript, King Alfonso. Um, these are the Cantigas. Uh, it's a book of um, versified miracles. They are set to music and they talk about all sorts of situations in daily life. Uh, of course, Jews appear here and they are often um, represented with uh, st certain stereotypes, physical stereotypes, so that you could 
identify them in the, in, the illum in the manuscript illuminations or illustrations. They wear pointed hats, they have uh, large distorted noses, and they normally look uh, evil, especially around the eyes. These are some Jews uh, engaging in money lending. And this is a Jew uh, who's an apothecary. An apothecary is uh, kind of a cross between a pharmacist and a, a spice seller. Um, some other Jews, for example, biblical Jews, this is uh, from an altarpiece in 14th century northern Spain in Tarragona. Uh, biblical Jews fared a little bit better because Christianity had appropriated them. And even though they're stereotyped uh, somehow, for example, by the shape of their beards, uh, they're, I think, treated more kindly. How did Jews represent themselves, though? Um, this is a 14th century Haggadah from uh, uh, Spain in Cat Catalonia. It's called the Golden Haggadah. And this represents, these scenes represent the preparation for Passover. Um, oftentimes, Jews did not choose to represent themselves as looking any different than their Christian neighbors because they really, they did not look like different from Christian neighbors. They chose to represent themselves following the same set, set of artistic conventions and the same kind of beauty ideals, the same attire as everybody else in society. Uh, you see, for example, the group of Miriam with, um, with uh, her friends uh, and some musical instruments. There are also uh, books where uh, there were collaboration between uh, Jewish and Christian artists. Um, this is the 15th century Bible of Alba. It's also known as the Bible of uh, Moshe Aragel. Moshe Aragel was a rabbi, the 15th century. He wrote a um, translation into Spanish, uh, a translation of the Jewish Bible. And he also wrote some commentary and glosses also in, sp in Old Spanish. He wrote this for a Spanish novel. And it's interesting to look at how uh, Moshe Aragel, uh, Rabbi Aragel was represented here. This is uh, one of the pages in the manuscript. And um, this is one attempt because here's a Jew who is an actual, is actually identified with an individual, that, uh, with a known individual, and he is the author of the book. This is an attempt to portray him um, as real, as, as in real life as possible. He's really, I don't think he's stereotyped. Um, he is the figure kneeling in front of the king, uh, presenting his work. And um, the only reason why you can tell that that's uh, Rabbi Aragel in terms of you know, any physical features is because he's wearing the Jewish mark on his cloak, the Jewish mark. Um, in uh, medieval Spain was the red circle. This is uh, another um, illumination of uh, Rabbi Aragel um, collaborating with his, uh, with his uh, Christian colleagues, two friars with whom he worked on his project. Now, how do we know be beyond um, visual sources, how do we know about Jews and about conversos in, in Spain? Well, we know about them through the same kind of documents that um, let us know about other Spaniards. We know th about them through municipal records, through legal records, um, court proceedings. We also know uh, about them through inquisitorial records. And this is a, a, a inquisitorial bundle um, housed at the University of California, Berkeley at the Bancroft Library. And this is just an example. The Inquisition um, compiled piles and piles and piles, rims and rims and rims of paper uh, telling the story of the conversos. Um, they wanted uh, a lot of evidence about what they were doing. They would call them and have them testify. And we really, what's, what's happening is that that allowed, allowed us to know a lot about their daily lives. And when one reads those records, one feels like one is really entering into a, into a conversation with real, with real people. We also know about the uh, conversos through literature. Um, the conversos wrote um, a vast amount of, of, of literature. Uh, in particular, what I, um, I've spent a lot of time reading has been their poetry. Uh, there's about uh, over 8,000 uh, poems in 15th century Spain, many of them written by conversos. 
Um, this uh, is a manuscript page uh, of, um, uh, of a poem written by one of my favorite authors. His name is Anton de Montoro. Anton de Montoro is a Jew living in southern Spain in Cordoba. He, um, he, was, a very, he was a tailor. He converted later in life. Uh, his wife was, we know that his wife was burnt at the stake. And his, uh, his life was, um, was really, was, he was, was a successful life, but it was also a bitter life. He was, it was successful because he was really successful as a tailor, uh, as, a prof as a professional. He was also really successful as a poet. His poetry was read, was copied, was imitated. He entered into poetic dialogues with many of the great poets of the time. He wrote for kings and queens. And this is a manuscript, the manuscript page uh, is um, where uh, we find one of my favorite poems. He, it, it's a heart-wrenching poem. It's a, a really gutsy poem. He writes to Queen Isabel um, in the wake of the establishment of the Inquisition, telling her about himself. It's his life as a converso and the fact that uh, he was never able to blend in. He has been, um, no matter how much he prayed, uh, no, matter, no matter how much pork he put in his adafinas, he was always treated as a Jew because Spanish society uh, considered that what, you can never stop being a Jew. For those of you who read Spanish, this will be um, available for you to read. It's, it's a it's a transcription of the poem. Um, but what did the conversos do for me after spending so much time uh, talking and reading them? Well, they read, really they did, I would say, I would summarize it in two main things. One, they introduced me to, to Judaism through them. I learned about Judaism. Um, they, those inquisitorial records probably had the opposite, um, the opposite uh, effect that they were, that they, for which they had been intended. Um, for me, uh, the, it, it was really eye-opening. Second, it really introduced me to a community uh, that as a Spanish national, I didn't really know I had. Uh, when I read uh, about the conversos and when I now meet uh, members of the Sephardic community, I really feel uh, like I'm seeing myself in the mirror. I feel like the gap, there's a huge gap that has been, that has been uh, closed. There's no longer a void. And I feel that with them, we can answer positively to the question, can you be Jewish and Spanish? And I think the answer is a yes. Thank you.